welcome everyone again. And uh, I'm Jeanette Alberti. I will be facilitating and hosting tonight. And I want to introduce Richard Lentinello, who is the publisher and editor of the Crankshaft magazine, as well as the author of Corvair Style and of the Cadillac Style magazine, uh, book, excuse me. Um, Richard's been a friend to the Corvair community. For those of you who've been around some of our national conventions, Richard was even a keynote speaker at one of them. So uh, he has written about Corvairs and he's uh, again, a friend of the community. My interest in Corvairs, this started way back in the early 60s when our postman pulled up in front of our house in Brooklyn with a with a Monza convertible, red. And I was just blown away. It's like, where's the engine? I mean, I was a little kid, you know, I was like eight years old. And it's like, the engine's in the back, you know? And ever since then, I always thought the Corvette was one of America's greatest post-war creations. You know, it was out of the box thinking, it was unique, it was different, it was stylish, easy to work on. And I've always been, uh, you know, fascinated with Corvairs. When I worked at Hemmings for many years, we always, I know I always try to put in as many Corvairs in the magazine as possible. And then uh, when I went out on my own, I just said, you know, I was going through my library one day and I said, there's very few Corvair books. I mean, it was how-to books, there was some performance books and, you know, general interest but nothing about the stories of the people who own Corvairs and that's why I wrote uh, Corvair style uh, to zero in on the people's love of the Corvair and uh, boy there were so many great stories out there you could do like 10 volumes of that book make them all different there's so many Corvair fanatics and the one thing I realized quickly was people don't own one Corvair I mean <laughs> It's like a disease, you know, you got to have more than one. I mean, you know, I got a bunch of Triumphs. You have more than one Triumph because you need parts. But same thing with the Corvairs. People own Corvairs. They own three, four, five of them. And uh, it's addicting. It really is. I had a 63 Monza convertible, uh, three-speed, the high compression engine. And uh, I sold that last year because I was moving to Tennessee and I was ready to launch my magazine crankshaft. So that's why I ended up selling that car, which is, you know, you need extra money. Last name is not Rockefeller, you know? So uh, you got to sell your cars to uh, make the next dream come true. And that next dream was crankshaft magazine. So uh, we've had one core bear in the magazine, believe it or not. And that gentleman is on with us. And let's see. I think he was issue number three, right, Ed? Let's let let's show everybody Ed. There he is. It was in this issue, issue number three, and we had Ed, Ed McClintock, and we featured him. And that's a feature we call "Still Playing with Cars." People who are basically, you know, sixty years old and over, who enjoy and work on their cars regularly and ed is down the road in uh in uh cleveland tennessee so i ran down there and did a story on him and that was interesting and another corvair fanatic and uh there's just so many great corvair stories uh next summer i'm trying to get to up to michigan ypsilanti and do eva the corvair lady so we're going to do a story on eva she's a wonderful person she's a corvair fanatic extreme I mean, she has like 10 Corvairs. She has no daily driver. Her daily driver is all Corvairs, no modern <laughs> car. <laughs> so uh, that's that's a lot of fun, uh, meeting all these different people. So, so Richard, uh, could you spend a few minutes just talking to us about um, Frank Chef Magazine. Why, why did you decide to start this magazine? Um, and by the way, I have a copy right here. My husband's a subscriber. And it, it, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it is a beautiful magazine. Oh, by the way, Eva just replied in chat. She has 11 now. So 11. <laughs> oh, I love her. She's great. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's, we all know there's a lot of four year, uh, sorry, car magazines out there. And this one is unique. And tell us about why you started it and what you see is unique about it. Well, uh, 
when I got pushed out of Hemmings after 22 years, they put in a new publisher who was 35 year old millennial who knows everything. <laughs> so I left in July of 20. And uh, I guess not so much for revenge to create a better magazine than what they were doing, but I've been a car magazine fanatic since the early 60s, going to the candy store on the corner and buying, you know, uh, Hot Rod and, and all those kind of magazine, popular hot rodding. And uh, I've just been enthused with car magazines my whole life. And uh, in the last 10 years or so, there's just a lot of junk being published, bottom line. Uh, I know in the last few years at Hemmings, they would publish articles based on advertisers' wants. We'll advertise if you write about us. And I was always against that because to me, the readers come first, not the advertisers. And I was told that's the wrong way to think. But without the readers, you don't have advertisers. And I was also a big fan of Automobile Quarterly back in the day. I have a complete collection and probably you can see it right behind me. Uh, and that was a beautiful magazine slash book. And I always felt that uh, the American made magazines uh, have too much advertising. Uh, there's too much quid pro quo with advertisers. And they're not really creating the great, interesting, engaging content that a real car enthusiast wants to read about. And I look to a lot of the European magazines like Octane, uh, Magneto, Classic and Sports Car. And even those are a little, you know, I mean, they're, they're very well done, very well written, uh, nice designs and layouts, but there's a lot of advertising, things like that. And you know, we'll eventually get into advertising but I wanted to create a magazine that is designed and written for the hardcore car enthusiast. Uh, take no prisoners. We, I, you know, get right into the facts. You know, uh, we have in the next issue of Crankshaft, which is issue five, uh, it's in the mail now. It was printed last week and it was shipped in the mail on Tuesday morning. So it's coming. Uh, we have six new features. So we have features about guys who are over 60, still playing with cars. We have a new feature coming called Signature Aesthetics, where we zero in on a design element of a car. Uh, we have something called I Bought It New, where we profile uh, original owners. And how come they bought that car and why do they still own it? And in this next issue is a 65 big block Impala SS. And the guy still has it. I met him at a local car show. I mean, it's just a great story. And uh, we have a book review coming in the next issue and something called Tarnished Treasures. Cars that are, they look like crap. <laughs> you know, they have a lot of rust. They have loaded with patina. But the guys drive them, or the women, whoever, they drive them, they enjoy them as is. And when I worked at Hemings Classic Car, I started a feature called Drivable Dreams. And those are cars that are like condition number four. You know, they really look awful, but they drive them. They have fun with them. And not everybody could afford a Pebble Beach quality automobile. And if you do, do you really want to drive it? You know, you put a chip in the paint or you scratch it and it gets wet and people go fanatic. They're more worried about trophies than anything else. But this is the enjoyment aspect of driving an old car as is. And that's tarnished treasures. And that's in the next issue. So we got some interesting things uh, coming down the line. Uh, it's, it's a struggle. I'll admit it. Uh, we've had four paper cost increases in the last 18 months, three postage increases in the last <laughs> year. And, uh, it's a struggle. So we're trying to get a little bit more advertising in the magazine to help pay the bills, but we'll never get to the point where advertising will overwhelm the editorial package. Go on, I'll also unmute. Richard, um, you mentioned going to car shows and finding people at car shows. Where do you get your cars to feature and how do you source the folks who have these interesting cars? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I work with a lot of guys and a lot of them don't go to car shows. A lot of these magazine editors, 
a lot of these magazine writers. To them, it's a nine to five job. And I think last year alone, I went to 35 different car shows up and down the East Coast. I'm just a car fanatic. And I go to these events. I'm a member of the AACA. In fact, I just got elected to the board of directors uh, last week. So uh, I go to the AACA events. I've gone to, you know, Spring Fest in uh, Helen, Georgia for the Corp Air Meet. I uh, went up to St. Charles and Buffalo for Corp Air shows. And I've done Triumph events. I mean, MG, Pontiac, doesn't matter. If it's something that I feel is interesting, I go and I keep notes of cars that I see at the shows, things that I find. And I have notes going back for 10 years. Some guys that have, you know, seen cars at, in Gettysburg, AACA meet, uh, Hershey, Carlisle, uh, Auto Fair in Charlotte. And uh, I just keep all these notes. And I keep, you know, little tidbits of information. I go, oh, God, this will make a great story. You know, oh, my God, this this guy found this. He bought this car new, a Chevelle SS. It's a 71. And I found that in Gettysburg a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I just get excited when I hear some of these great stories that they need to be told. It's, it's almost like our World War II veterans, you know. They should have been interviewed years ago, and all their stories should have been kept for historical, you know, reasons. So I feel it's the same thing with cars, especially an original owner or a long-term owner of a collector car. And there's so many great, interesting stories out there. And uh, everywhere I go, I, I talk to people, you know, I've been a judge at Amelia Island, uh, Hilton Head, uh, the Elegance at Hershey. And as I'm judging cars, I'm talking to the owners. It's like, gee, that, that'd be a great story. Oh my God, I got to do a magazine on my own so I can get this car in there, you know? And that's what I do. I just keep lots of notes and I go everywhere. I mean, this guy in the next issue with the 65 uh, Impala, the original owner, I found them at a local car show. There was like 13 cars at this local church show, but you just never know. So I take two, three hours out of my day on a Saturday. I hit the local show and you never know what you find. Great. So we did get a question in an advance of this. Um, people often will send in questions. And uh, you know, one of the questions that people are asking is, you know, where do you see this hobby going? People collecting cars or, or basically saving a car. Um, you know, many people are saying that younger people, the you know, the generation that would follow us. They may not have the, the money or the time to be able to be in vintage cars. Kind of what are you hearing and seeing in terms of where this hobby is going? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I mean, you know, when I was in high school back in the early 70s, you could pick up a a Nova, a 66 Nova for 100 bucks. You know, you could pick up all sorts. You could pick up a Corvair for, you know, 100, 200 bucks. You can't do that anymore with these young kids. They got to spend thousands. Uh, but I have met some young guys who are in their late 20s, early 30s, who are into early cars, brass era, mm -hmm. two cylinder cars, you know. And I met them at Hershey and I was talking to them. I said, why are you guys into, you know, Model T's and Trumbulls and Moons and all these early stuff? And they said, well, our jobs involve being on a computer all day. And it's rewarding to get back to simplicity, something simple with no computers. And this is what we like. And this is this is undercurrent of really young people who are into old, old cars. There is these two young ladies, I would say they're maybe mid to late 20s outside of Charlotte, and they're into Model T's. They each have a Model T. I think they have two or three of them between each other. And, you know, it's, it's, they're out there. You just got to, you know, find them. Uh, a lot of uh, people of our generation, or even, you know, our parents, you know, they're dying off. They're leaving cars to their grandkids and kids. And, uh, you know, take a kid to a car show. That helps. Uh, where is going? I think that the uh, hobby needs to open up their arms and hearts to some of the younger people who are into the Japanese cars. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, but let's face it. I mean, wouldn't you like to drive around in a 68 Toyota? I mean, it's something different, you know, it's, it's very 
rudimentary. It's very basic. But they used to be all over the place, like a Volkswagen mm -hmm. Beetle, you know, uh, early dots and Zs. You know, those are starting to go up in price. But uh, we got to open up the hobby to accept some of them. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, the new stuff like, you know, a Subaru WRX and they have those giant trash can mufflers and they look and sound awful. You know, not them, but uh, some of the later cars from the, you know, 90s or even the early 2000s, uh, the hobby needs to expand and accept them. So uh, it, it, it's a challenge. You know, cars are expensive. So uh, a lot of young kids can't afford them. But if they're exposed to it, like McPherson College, and you have a lot of these RPM programs to teach young kids about restoration. So they're getting into it, and they're bringing their friends into it, and their brothers and sisters. So uh, there is a movement out there. It just doesn't get a lot of exposure. I know our Corvairs are, I always believe, a, a, a relatively um, less expensive entry-level vintage collector kind of car and we just every time we show ours around in the dallas area we get a lot of uh, younger folks that are very interested in it because of the uniqueness of it yep. that the corvair is different and they want something different let's be different so the uh the engine and of course the simplicity of working on it they like to so so i love where you're going which is embracing some of the newer kinds of cars that are out there that are unique and different too. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of interesting late model cars. I mean, uh, getting back to the Corvair, when I lived in Massachusetts, uh, I was living about maybe an hour from Clark's, Clark's Corvair up in Shelburne Falls. And every two years they had a big Corvair meet and I would go up there and talk to the people. And it's just, it's infectious you know they just love their corvairs and they would bring their grandkids along and you know some kids in the street would stop by and they, they wanted to know more about the cars every time i drove my monza convertible i would stop at a gas station you know they would always ask me questions about it and they were like wow i never knew that you know so you know getting out and about with your car is a good thing but uh yeah it, it remains to be seen you know what the future holds especially with gas and electricity, you know, electric cars, all that stuff. But uh, I still think everything will remain healthy for foreseeable future. So Great. I hope so. Well, one of the questions in the chat, you mentioned driving your convertible, your Monza convertible. The question was, uh, do you have a favorite Corvair? Yeah, I do. Uh, although I would like to get Ed McClintock's, you know, uh, station wagon that he has laying in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> My wife loves those Colvin station wagons, but uh, a 65, 66 Corsa Coupe, that would be my first choice. I I found it a little uncomfortable to drive my 63 Monza. It was really tight. And I know Clark sells a relocating kit to move the seat back, and I never got around to doing that. Uh, but I, I fit better in the second generation models. So... Uh, a second generation coupe would be on my list. If it's not a Corsa, no big deal. 110 horsepower is plenty enough. You know, I'm not uh, 18 years old driving, you know, 90 miles an hour like an idiot. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's nice to go slow and smell the roses. So right. a coupe to me is just, is an absolutely great looking automobile. I think it's one of the best looking and best styled American cars of the post-war era. <laughs> I don't think you'd get very many on this car, Paul, arguing that. <laughs> um, so I, we got another question that came in before sure. um, asking about the Corvair style book. Basically, what made you decide to write a book about Corvairs? You mentioned earlier there were so many great stories, but as you heard those stories, what made you put this together? Because for those of you who haven't seen it, it is a gorgeous book. Um, and we're very proud to have one of our cars in here too. So uh, I'm not bragging just because ours is in here, but it is a beautiful book. So Thank tell you. us a little bit more about what made you put this together. How'd you go about doing it? Well, you know, when I was working at Hemmings, you know, uh, I would always try to get Corvairs featured in the magazine every couple of issues. If I had my way, it would have been one in every issue. But uh, when I started going out and about and going to, you know, the Corsa conventions and things like that, 
I would talk to the people and there was, they were just so into their Corvairs. And again, there weren't that many books on the Corvair uh, that told personal stories, the human interest element, uh, shall we say, you know, uh, there's lots of stuff out there on performance modifications and putting V8s in and all that stuff. And, you know, that's cool if you like that stuff. But uh, I wanted to focus on original cars and the people behind them and why they like them. So what I did was uh, I started going out and about and gathering stories. And then I hired uh, a former uh, graphic designer from Hemmings who left the company. And uh, he designed it for me. And uh, the rest is history. I mean, we had 2,500 copies printed. We're down to about 125 remaining. That's about it. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it has taken off. It, it has helped pay for the, the launch of Crankshaft magazine. So whatever money I made from Corvair style, uh, I put into Crankshaft. But I think the hobby needs a good quality uh, classic car magazine that focuses on all different types of classic cars. Post-war, pre-war, American, European, whatever. Uh, that is well done, well written. There's no slang. You know, we don't call a station wagon a long roof. It's a station wagon, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, and we, we definitely try not to write above the reader's head. We, we try to write, and I tell all my writers to write as if you're talking to your friends. You know, be down to earth. Don't use no $20 words. We don't need that. You know, just just be honest and forthright and get the hardcore information that we want. And whatever you do, don't get information from Wikipedia. You got to do your research. You know, you go to the experts of the clock clubs, like in, in the first issue of Crankshaft, uh, issue number one, we did a story on a Tucker. That Tucker took 16 pages to tell. We contacted John Tucker, which was Preston Tucker's grandson. We contacted his two great grandsons and we got inside hardcore information that took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. Uh, but that's what we try to do with Crankshaft. We try to get real information from the horse's mouth. We don't take, you know, second, third, you know, stuff you find on the Internet. Because most of the stuff on the Internet is just, you know, regurgitated information that has a lot of falsehoods and lies and misinformation. So, uh, so the launch, like I said, you know, Thanks to people buying Corvair style, uh, we were able to launch Crankshaft. But it, it was a lot of fun doing uh, Corvair style. It really was. I met some great people, uh, saw some great car collections. There were some wonderful Corvairs out there. And if I had the time and money, I would do a second follow-up because I met so many other people that have great cars that really need to be told. These stories need to be told. So. Uh, I guess I need a backer. <laughs> you know? Maybe do a, what is a, not a go not a GoFundMe, but a, you know one of these um, startup kind of deals where people can buy in. Right. Um, someone did ask if previously released issues of Crankshaft are still available. Yes, uh, issue one is available. Uh, issue issue two issue two is still available as is issue three. However, just last week, issue four sold out. So we don't have any more issue number four. I'm sure you may be able to find it on the newsstands at Barnes & Noble and some select books a million stores. There's, there may be a few copies floating around. Most of them are probably taken off the newsstand now because issue five now has been shipped to the bookstores and distributors. But, uh, yeah, we're offering a deal now where if you buy a copy of a Corvair style, we'll give you issue number one free just mm -hmm. to get it out there. So, uh, you know, we only print like 4,000 copies of each. So uh, it, it's not like, you know, a hot rod magazine where they print, you know, 250,000 copies. You know, uh, we're not a big publishing company. It's just me. It's not like Hemings or Peterson or any of these, you know, for, formerly Peterson. Some of these big companies like Road and Track who have huge staff. They have big finance behind them. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of depleted my 401k, which I shouldn't have, to get this magazine going. 
but I feel that the hobby really does need a good quality American published classic car magazine. And that's my goal. Well, it's it, again, for those of you who have seen it, um, you know what I'm going to say, which is it shows through the articles and through the voice, the basic voice that you have and what you write about the cars, about the owners. It has a, it's a, it's very much like a tribute. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you can sense the love of these cars through the words that you use as well as the picture. So um, it's, it's not just a coffee table magazine. You want to read what's in here. Because uh, as he mentioned about the Tucker, it's, uh, you basically wrote a historical document that someone doing research on this car years from now has a historical document here of the Tucker because you did the research. So it's, uh, it's well That's worth it. I, this, this wasn't meant to just be an advertisement, by the way. We're all <laughs> car people on this, uh, on this call. We're car geeks, right? And uh, that's geeks. what shows, yes, through this. Well, you know, I, I, tell, I tell the writers who write for me, focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. There's too much negativity going around in the world. You know, talk about the design and the style and the engineering. See if you could, you know, get some real good insight and if you can't contact the clubs and find out an expert who knows the most about that particular model car that you're writing about and focus on the positive you know we don't want to read negativity about you know whether a car is ugly or anything else let's face it all cars have pros and cons so we'll talk about the cons in a very respectful way but we focus on the positive uh we focus on design and style and we try to interview the owners and get directly from them. What's it like to own this car? You know, what's it like to drive? You know, uh, try to try to put the reader behind the wheel and let them really enjoy themselves while they're reading this article. And I have uh, two ladies who do the graphic design, the layouts. One's in New Hope, Pennsylvania. The other one's in South Jersey. And uh all this stuff is sent via the computer and they sent me stuff and then we go back and forth and we edit it. And then I, after I finalize everything, I send it to another editor in, in Fort Lauderdale and then he proofs everything. And then I send it to an expert and they, they proof it. Then we come back and sometimes we go through, you know, a particular layout could do eight, 10 revisions. We try to get, you know, the grammar correct. I mean, I wasn't, you know, a great grammar student. I wasn't a, I wasn't a journalist major in college. I wasn't anything like that. So I rely on a lot of experts to uh, make me sound like Shakespeare, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to make sure that we have uh, the punctuation correct and the syntax correct. And every now and then you make a mistake that gets through. You can't help it. But uh, we really try hard to put out a really good quality product that people love. And to be honest with you, uh, we haven't got any negative mail. The only negative mail is when's the next issue? How come it's late? What's wrong with you guys? Don't you know you're not on schedule? Yeah, I know. We're only one guy. But uh, people love the magazine, and I'm really that makes me really happy. Some guy just recently said he's been in publishing for 45 years, and uh, this is the best car magazine he's ever seen. And that made me feel That's great. Cool. Wow. I got an email from an 80-year-old guy who said this is his favorite car magazine since he was buying car magazines back in the early 50s. It's like, you know, it just made my day, really did. That's great. And, and by the way, a lot of nice comments in the chat and you just sold a uh, Corvair style. Someone oh, just bought one. Fabulous. Said they may be gone soon. Um, so Richard, what's the car or the story that you've been um, searching for? You know, what, what are you on the hunt for that you haven't found yet? Either the car or the story? Well, you know, I get some people sometimes they go, Oh, I got a I got a rare car. My my grandfather or my cousin has this really rare car. I go, oh, what is it? Oh, it's a fifty-seven Chevy. Well, what do I want a fifty-seven Chevy for? <laughs> you know, they have a dime a dozen. Yeah, then, you know. Uh so we're always on the search for things that are different. Number one, I love original owners. You know, as each day passes, there's less and less of them. You know, to find last Last month, I drove up to Northern Ohio. I made a one-day trip, 
just to get this story on a 1936 Hudson. The guy's father bought it new. It's a great story. It's in the next issue, issue five. So uh, original owners or one family owned cars, uh, those have such great tales and stories to tell. It makes fascinating reading. Uh, but I tell people, you know, let us know what you have. Uh, if it's a 69 Camaro or a 68 Mustang, I'm not going to be interested unless you're the original owner or, or the car has a million miles on it, something different. But uh, we try to avoid cars that are in the regular magazines. I mean, you pick up other car magazines and it's the same stuff. It's the same Corvairs, Camaros, Mustangs, like, oh, you know, or they have high end Ferraris that, you know, a 250 GTO that's worth, you know, 70 million. Well, who can relate to that? But I, speaking of Ferraris, I found this great story. This lady, she's in her mid 70s. Her father bought her a 250 Lusso Ferrari when she graduated uh, college. And she still owns it. Never been restored. She still drives it. She's in well into her 70s. So that's a great Ferrari story. It's not like, you know, some guy, you know, became rich overnight with a dot com and has all these Ferraris in his garage. Big deal. But it has to be some human interest element that makes the story engaging and interesting and fascinating to read. So uh, we love four door sedans. A lot of, you know, when I was at Hemmings, my uh, publisher would say to me, Lentinello, you put too many sedans in the magazine. I said, let me tell you something, knucklehead. The reason I do that is because most families had four-door sedans. And that's what people could relate to. Not many people had, you know, convertibles or hard tops. I mean, they did. They were out there. But the sedan was the car. You know, business coupes, you know, uh, the forgotten cars. I love stripped-down cars with basic information, with, you know, basic trim. And those were the real cars that, you know, that were the popular back in the day. But yet those were the ones that were never saved or restored. Everybody wants to have, you know, cars that are dolled up with all the trim and all the excess accessories. But when you see your car stripped down, that's when you can really enjoy and appreciate the design and the style of the car for what it was originally intended to be. So stripped down models is, is another great thing. And of course, Corvairs. You know, uh, I'm looking for a Vega right now in the future, <laughs> you know, just something wow. different. And uh, I also like putting in cars that will annoy people. They go, why am I spending this money? And there's a Pinto in here. Well, if it's the original owner of Pinto. That's a great story. Why yeah. not? <laughs> you know? So well, we, we just recently, a few of us showed our station wagons at the muscle car uh, show in Rosemont, Illinois, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we were parked across from a lot of Camaros. So, as I said, the fancy pants Camaros. And I would say, uh, when people came around the corner and they saw the Corvairs, they immediately went to the Corvairs, and we got a tremendous reception. There were four beautiful station wagons there, and uh, people were just so fascinated in them. Uh, I didn't hear too often, oh, my grandma had one. What I was hearing is, Wow, what is what would this take to have a car like this? Or where can I buy a pool bear? So there's a huge interest in different, uh, something unique. You know, like you mm -hmm. say, you could see Camaros in the magazines. There were lots of Camaros, yeah. there were lots of beautiful cars, but we were just the, the odd cars there. They they really enjoyed seeing something different. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, my neighbor died in Massachusetts, and I found out that he had a 69 Camaro, he was the original owner. And I was able to buy it from his estate. It was right next door. I got the 69 Camaro. It was a base model. And uh, I had it for about three weeks. I sold it and bought a Corvair. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to drive right a Camaro. I mean, it was, I mean, it had a lot of rust. But still, I, I had a lot more fun with the Corvair because people don't know what it is. You That's know? right. So, and I love the fact that it's air-cooled and the engine's in the back. and You know, it's just different, you know. Yeah. But, uh yeah, uh, they have a lot of fun. They really are. And the people that yeah. I've met in the Corvair hobby are just wonderful. Well, we are a wonderful group. We're just, uh, we're passionate about these crazy little cars. And mm -hmm. uh, we're happy. We're, we're always so thrilled when people want to talk to us about them. Because I think our members are just the greatest ambassadors to get people interested in these cars. 
Um, there is a question that I thought was unique too, and I'm gonna read it. What accounts for Richard's parallel Corvair triumph obsession? So you have you like Corvairs and you like Triumph. What what the why that parallel obsession here? Uh you know, growing up in Brooklyn in the 60s, uh, there was a lot of abandoned cars, stolen cars all over the streets. And I would jump in them every time I saw them just to see what it's like to sit in this kind of car. And one day we went down to Coney Island to go fishing for snappies. And there was this Spitfire sitting on the beach with no wheels. And I sat in it and I go, wow, this is like a racing car. It's so low. And I like the shape, you know. And uh, I guess I was about 15. And I started, you know, mowing lawns. And before you know it, I saved up $650 and I bought that Triumph Spitfire in 1968. Uh, no, 1974, I bought it. And I still have it. It's in my garage. Uh, it's only 25,000 miles on it. And I just, you know, you start reading about a certain mark and you really get into the history behind it. And I always liked Triumphs. Uh, to be honest with you, I love all kinds of cars. Uh, Pontiacs especially. They had unique engineering, especially with their cylinder heads and engines. Uh, Pontiacs are very special. Uh, I'm a big BMW 2002 fanatic. I've had like eight of those uh, through the years. I love Alfa Romeos, uh, Chrysler leather cars, or any kind of, you know, Mopars. I like those. Buicks. Oh my. I grew up in a Buick family. My father was a typical GM guy. He started with Oldsmobiles, he went up to Buicks, then he went to Cadillacs, just like Alfred Sloan predicted. He, you know, so I grew up in a GM household. Uh, I had a couple of Fords, all three Fords, blue engines. So I'm not interested in Fords, but I do like, you know, uh, early uh, Falcons, things like that. Uh, I like all kinds of cars, to be honest with you. I, I see the positive in almost every type of automobile out there. Now, Ed McClintock, I think, wants a little more update on your TR3 restoration. He just put a comment out there asking. I that. saw that. You know, when I moved to Tennessee last year, uh, I got a storage unit, and I had a 26-foot U-Haul uh, truck loaded with parts. I mean, it was so loaded that we had to change the tires because it was just loaded. Engines, transmission. I had a TR3 body. And then when they gave me the uh, storage unit here in, in Knoxville, it, it wouldn't fit. And I put a thing on Facebook and Ed McClintock said, hey, I got a big garage down in, you know, near Chattanooga. You could put it there. And he was so kind. I greatly appreciate it, Ed. And uh, I stuck my TR3 body in his garage for a couple of months until I moved down here. And uh, now it's, it's all in primer. I had the body rebuilt by Mark Macy, Macy's Garage in uh, Tip City, Ohio. He specializes in those cars. And just today, I've been working on the chassis, uh, completing the front suspension. And I bought it as a basket case, which I don't advise anyone to do. I bought this car. It was totally disassembled. It was hundreds of boxes, cigar boxes, jars. Nothing was labeled. The guy died. And uh, so I sit there. And it could take me three hours trying to figure out what this nut is for, what this bracket is for. And I find it very fascinating. It, it, it's, it's relaxing to do. And that's what I've been doing. I've been assembling my TR3 chassis now. And uh, I hope that, you know, I'll paint the body come spring, summer. I do my own painting. So uh, then we put the body on the chassis. I, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's like a big, giant model kit when you were a kid. You know, except you're not using glue, you're using real nuts and bolts. So uh, it's a lot of fun. A kid or a, pu or a puzzle, too. Um, there is a question about what you think about Pontiac Fieros. Someone wrote that they have an 86 SC that they bought new. So I want to get your thoughts oh. on Fieros. I always liked Fieros. I think it was a great concept. It was a typical GM mistake where they finally got it right and then they canceled it. You know, they never should have. That was a wonderful concept, especially where the body panels bolt on and bolt off. Uh, I always wanted to buy one, but every time I've sat in one, I just, there's not enough room for me. But I'm 6'3", and my knees kept hitting the dash 
almost like an, you know, I always wanted the Jaguar XK120 until I sat in one. I couldn't even hit the pedals. And same thing with a Lotus Europa. There's a lot of cars that I just can't fit in, which is good because it means you can't buy them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I think the Fiero is a pretty cool car. I really do. There's a lot of positives about it. And uh, I wish I could own one one day, but I just can't fit in them. Well, that's probably good for your budget and your garage space that you can't be collecting more, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I want to ask another question that came in uh, before the, the, the meeting. Um, and it's kind of thinking out into the future. What cars of today do you think we'll be collecting in the future? What do you see in today that you think people want to keep their eye on or maybe they're going to they're going to hold on to. Well, I don't know about new cars. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there will come a time, but it'll be so difficult to restore. I mean, with all the plastic and electronics, I think you got to be insane. But, you know, you never know. Uh, I think the Buick Riata will be collectible. Uh, also, Bill Tofero, uh, if I spelled that correctly, if I pronounced it correctly, uh, you know, uh, the Cadillac XLR that was based on a Corvette, you know, uh, the first generation Subaru WRX, especially the STI, uh, some of those cars uh, will be highly collectible. But uh, when it comes to new stuff or late model, I'm, I really don't read about them. I just have no interest in all the high tech stuff out there and all this ABS. I mean, you know, it's good and everything, but, you know. If I want to enjoy myself, I like old cars. Yeah. You you feel more attached to the road. You feel, you know, like you're part of the machine instead of being isolated. And if you go to a crowded parking lot, you can pick out your car from a mile away. You know, <laughs> all the new cars, they all look alike. So, uh, so true. I'm sure there's things out there that people will find collectible, like first generation Lexus and some of those things. But, you know, hey, whatever floats your boat. So. It's kind of hard to say what the next generation will want or collect. So now someone did uh, make a point about the Saturn Sky and Pontiac Solstice. Oh yes, uh, as a good newer collector car. You still see those on the road. I mean, those are pretty popular still. You do, and I I've been thinking about getting a uh, Pontiac Solstice. I looked at one recently, had too many miles on it, and it was beat. Every time I look at a car to buy, if I see wires hanging from underneath the dash, I avoid it because I know it's been messed with. And this Solstice was messed with. I think the Pontiac Solstice is a very cool car. Same thing with the Saturn Sky. Uh, I had a 98 Saturn that I bought new, and it was the best car I ever owned. So I know their engineering was, is, was on the money. I love that car. I wish I still had it. Uh, so those, those cars, right. I, I agree with that person. Sure. Well, it, maybe this is, you just answered this. What's the car that you find the most enjoyable to daily drive, to drive daily? Uh, I drive a Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> I we bought it brand new. I loved that car. I wish we wouldn't have sold it. <laughs> it I bought it brand new in, in 2013 when I lived in Florida. I oh, just okay. hit 109,000 miles. Uh, I shift into neutral when I go first to second all the time because I don't want to ruin the second gear synchro. Every time I go somewhere, I open the hood to let the heat out because I don't want heat soak to ruin the plugs or to ruin, you know, the hoses and everything underneath the hood. People think I'm a fanatic with it, but uh, it's a fun car. I get 42 miles a gallon. And it took me a while to find one without a sunroof because of my height. I didn't want the sunroof to impede and sit on my head. And I don't need to look at the sky when I'm driving. So uh, it's a lot of fun. I love that car. It's a six-speed, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, they're great cars to drive. Um, there is a question, though, about ordering Corvair style. Um, how do I get a copy of Crankshaft when ordering Corvair style? Is that just part of the deal? or how, how would you uh, if, if, if you order Corvair style from our website, lentinello.com, that's L-E-N-T-I-N-E-L-L-O. -L -L we automatically give you a copy of Crankshaft number one. If you just want to order a single copy of Crankshaft or subscribe, you go to crankshaftmagazine.com. 
So we have two different websites for that. Good one. Um, I'm going to end with one last question. Are there any cards that people collect that surprise you that they would collect them? And are there any values right now with vintage cards that surprise you? Any prices you're seeing that surprise you? And then any cards that you see and go, I'm oh, surprised that people would collect that. Yeah, you know, I mean, one of my dream cards is a 68 Dodge Charger and a 64 Pontiac GTO. Uh, those are my two favorite muscle cars. And the prices are insane. I saw a rusted out, it looked like it was burnt in a fire, a 68 Charger. Like I wanted $35,000 for it. Hey, I think he's smoking dope. I mean, come on, you know? Uh, I had a 64 Le Mans, which I wish I never sold, but I always wanted a 64 GTO. And now I see them, you know, 50, 60, $70,000. And it's like, that's crazy. I mean, I wish and I hope that the collector car market, and a lot of people don't want to hear this, I hope it crashes a little so the prices come down. Because when the prices come down, the real hardcore people could buy more cars. That's how I look at it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you can't take it with you. You know, I don't look at cars as investments. I really don't. I think it's great to own as many as possible if you have room. You know, at one point I had 10 cars in my garage in uh, Massachusetts. And I wish I had a bigger garage here in Tennessee, but I don't. Because if I did, it would be loaded with cars. And, uh, you know, if the prices do come down, maybe there's a correction in the market, which always happens every, you know, decade or so. It'll be able to help the real enthusiasts go out there and maybe get the car of their dream once prices come down. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting when you talk prices and values. Some people get upset. They want their cars to go high in value, and I don't. I mean, if, if all my cars crash in value and are worthless, it wouldn't phase me at all because I'm not going to sell them. I'm going to keep them. I'm going to hand them off to my daughters. I got two lovely daughters, and they're going to get my triumph. So I could care less what they're worth. That's a great That's great outlook. That's great. Although for those of us with Corvair, sometimes we would like to see the value go up a little bit. <laughs> so. I, th I think they have gone up in the last few years. Maybe, maybe Corvair style helped push. I don't know. I don't want to be blamed for that. <laughs> no, you, no blame. We, we would appreciate that. We like seeing them appreciate a little bit more too. So um, I'm going to kind of wrap things up here. We've had some really good comments out there. I don't know if you've been able to keep an eye on them. Uh -huh. A lot of real positives. And uh, someone also commented that they've been handing out uh, flyers at car shows. Basically, they're showing people your magazine at the car shows. So thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, there you go. Getting you some additional uh, business here with your magazine. Um, and again, um, for those of you who haven't seen these magazines, it's certainly worth looking at them. And you said you have about 100 copies of Corvair Style still available? About, yeah, we have, about okay. I keep a tally over here, uh, 110 copies left. Okay. And uh, you know, again, this wasn't meant to be one big advertisement, but I'm glad we can advertise for it because as our community, and those of us who've been who are sitting on this call are aficionados of the Corvair. It's so nice to see that our little car is appreciated. And, yes. and your magazine helped show the world this is really a beautiful car and a, and a car worth uh, owning and caring about because the history of it um, being so unique in the automotive history. Plus, it's just a really cool car to drive. They are, they are. And, you know, uh, as we go into spring, like I said, I'm going to make every effort to get up to Ypsilanti to, to interview Eva, because that is a great story. She's a wonderful lady, a Corvette, Corvair fanatic, extreme. <laughs> so that's going to be a great story on Eva, the Corvair lady. And if I could get some other, you know, Corvairs, you know, we can't feature a Corvair in every issue or every other issue, but, you know, They'll always be in the forerunning. But, and it certainly helps promote our hobby when if someone just commented on here having the various books. So I want to thank Richard for uh, actually, I sent him an email and he was so kind to reply back right away. Sure, I'll come and talk about cars with you guys. Sure. And uh, 
And I'm so glad we were able to work this out. It's kind of a big gift to us, our, our little early Christmas present here to have awesome. you on the call. And also your uh, dedication to the, to the automotive uh, collecting and the interest in automobiles out there is a gift to our community too. Not just Corvairs, but just the right. overall community. Because if you're- hobby uh, Yeah, if you're sure. into the hobby. So um, thank you for everything you're doing to continue to promote this hobby. Um, and for putting out this beautiful magazine. And again, I want to thank everybody on the call who's been putting questions out there and comments, a lot of positive comments. I love seeing the comments about people talking about other cars too. Uh, GTO, Bonneville, people are talking yep. about other vehicles too. Oh, so, when you're a car person, you're a car person. You exactly. shouldn't have any prejudice against cars. Exactly. Yep. And, uh, you know, all kinds that are out there. So once again, thank you everybody for joining. And thank you, Richard, for uh, participating. And we look forward to seeing you at events. He said something earlier uh, that I just want to reinforce to everybody. Work on your cars over winter and get them out there. Let people see these cars. Let them see you driving them. Talk to people at car shows. Uh, it's great to hear all the interest that people have in our cars. So be out there. Be visible. And, yeah, and don't something. don't save your car for the next owner. That's right. <laughs> I tell people that all the time. I met one guy who had a 51 Mercury convertible. He never put the top down. I said, you know something? If you die and your widow sells me that car, the first thing I'm doing, I'm putting the top down. I said, so you might as well enjoy driving a convertible because the next owner is going to do that. So don't that. save the car for the next owner. Drive it. Enjoy it. Have fun. That's great. That is the best, that's the best statement. We're all going to be using that.